right, well, welcome to Faith Church. Glad you're with us. If you're kind of new around here, my name's Matthew, one of the pastors here, and it's a joy to open the scriptures with you each week. So would you grab your Bible and join me in Acts chapter 10? Uh, we've been walking through the book of Acts together. We love to study the scriptures. Uh, in fact, if you're kind of new to studying the scriptures and you don't have your own Bible in print version and would like one, We'd love to help you have one. We've got them available out in our lobby. Just stop by and grab anybody with one of those lanyards that say hosts, and they would love to help you get a Bible in your hands. And uh, we're, we're in Acts 10, and for those who have got our Fresh Start Bible, we're on page 959. And uh, I'm going to jump right in because I want to read the entirety of this chapter to us today and allow the words to be heard but received in our hearts and grab the full context of what is happening throughout this passage. All right, Acts chapter 10, starting in verse 1, this is what the scripture says. In Caesarea, there lived a Roman army officer named Cornelius. He was a captain of the Italian regiment. He was a devout, God-fearing man, as was everyone in his household. He gave generously to the poor and prayed regularly to God. One afternoon, about three o'clock, he had a vision in which he saw an angel coming toward him. Cornelius, the angel said. Cornelius stared at him in terror. What is it, sir? He asked the angel. And the angel replied, your prayers and gifts to the poor have been received by God as an offering. Now, send some men to Joppa and summon a man named Simon Peter. He is staying there with Simon, a tanner who lives near the seashore. As soon as the angel was gone, Cornelius called two of his household servants uh, and a devout soldier, one of his personal attendants, and he told them what had happened and sent them off to Joppa. The next day, as Cornelius' messengers were nearing the town, Peter went up on the flat roof to pray. It was about noon, and he was hungry. But while a meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance, and he saw the sky open, and something like a large sheet was let down and by its four corners. And in the sheet, there were all sorts of animals, reptiles, and birds. Then a voice said to him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. No, Lord, Peter declared, I... I've never eaten anything that our Jewish laws have declared impure and unclean. But the voice spoke again. Do not call something unclean if God has made it clean. The same vision was repeated three times. Then the sheet was suddenly pulled up to heaven. Peter was very perplexed. What could the vision mean? Just then, the men sent, to, sent by Cornelius found Simon's house. Standing outside the gate, they asked if a man named Simon Peter was staying there. Meanwhile, as Peter was puzzling over this vision, the Holy Spirit said to him, Three men have come looking for you. Get up, go downstairs, and go with them without hesitation. Don't worry, for I have sent them. So Peter went down and said, I'm the man you're looking for. Why have you come? They said, we are sent by Cornelius, a Roman officer. He is a devout and God-fearing man, well-respected by the Jews. A, a holy angel instructed him to summon you to his house um, so that he uh, can hear your message. So Peter invited the men to stay for the night. The next day, he went with them, accompanied by some of the brothers from Joppa. They arrived in Caesarea the following day. Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered his home, Cornelius fell at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter pulled him up and said, Stand up, I'm, I'm a human being just like you. And so they talked together and went inside where many others were assembled. Peter told them, You, you know it is against our laws for a Jewish man to enter a Gentile home like this, or even to associate with you. But God has shown me that I should no longer think of anyone as impure or unclean. So I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. Now tell me, why have you sent for me? 
Cornelius replied, Four days ago I was praying in my house about the same time, three o'clock in the afternoon, and suddenly a man in dazzling clothes was standing in front of me, and he told me, Cornelius, your prayers have been heard, and your gifts to the poor have been noticed by God. Now send messengers to Joppa and summon a man named Simon Peter. He's staying in the home of Simon a tanner who lives near the seashore. So I sent for you at once, and it was good of you to come. Now we are all here, waiting before God to hear the message the Lord has given to you. Then Peter replied, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. In every nation, he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. This is the message of good news for the people of Israel, that there is peace with God through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. And everybody said... You know what happened through Judea, beginning in Galilee, after John began preaching his message of baptism? Oh, and you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Then Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we apostles, wow, we were witnesses of all he did throughout Judea and in Jerusalem. And they put him to death by hanging him on the cross. But God raised him to life on the third day. Then God allowed him to appear, not, not, not to the general public, but to us whom God had chosen in advance to be his witnesses. We were those who ate and drank with him and after he rose from the dead. And he ordered us to preach everywhere and to testify that Jesus is the one appointed by God to judge as judge of all, the living and the dead. He is the one all of the prophets testified about, saying that everyone who believes in him will have their sins forgiven through his name. Even as Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who were listening to the message. The Jewish believers who came with Peter were amazed that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles too. For they heard them speaking in other tongues and praising God. Then Peter asked, Can anyone object to their being baptized now that they have received the Holy Spirit just as we did? So he gave orders for them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And afterwards, Cornelius asked him to stay with them for several days. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Amen? Hey, let's pray. Jesus, would you help us to see you, hear you, and know you today? Would you allow us to experience you like Cornelius did, where we move from an awareness of God to placing our full allegiance in Jesus Christ? May we trust in you more and more. We pray this in the name of the Father who loves us, the Son who died for us, and the Holy Spirit who lives in us. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. What a crazy story. And it features kind of two people, Peter and Cornelius. Cornelius was a a God-fearing, but not Jesus-worshipping man. He was God-fearing, did good. He was devout, the New Living says. And and that word devout means he he did the right thing at the right time. He, He was good in culture. He was a good citizen. He was a Roman officer, which, which meant he, he represented a place of power. He had some leadership and influence, and he did really good things to, to, to kind of help those along who needed help. He, was, he, he did all that he could within the place that he could. He, he was a man living with an allegiance to Rome in a culture that had its full allegiance, that Caesar was Lord, no one else was, and and he lived in in a place where he was trying to do the best in his culture, in his community, and in his context to help those around him. He was a God fearing man, but he wasn't Jesus worshiping. And that's what Peter came and preached to him. I think the the more we become aware of Jesus, the more our allegiances grow in his direction. I think the same is true for them. Once they heard Peter declare the story of Jesus, the gospel, 
that Jesus came to, he was sent, he was empowered, he was filled, he did these miracles, he, had, he, he overcame the enemy, and he did all of these things, and then he died and was crucified and rose again, and they were witnesses of his resurrection and of his power, and he sent them out to, to preach everywhere that, that all who believe in him would have their sins forgiven through his name, and he was helping them see who Jesus was, and when that happened, there was something that was awakened in them and they received the fullness of the spirit in that moment there was something that awakened in their soul that wasn't previously awakened they began to meet the real jesus in real time and something shifted in him now being a god-fearing person is good being a, a positive impact in your culture is good helping the poor is really good but really good doesn't get you eternal life. Really good doesn't get your sins forgiven and redeemed and renewed. It's really good. Proverbs says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's not the culmination of wisdom. It's the starting point. And what we find here is that Cornelius had an awareness and really an affinity for God. Like he, he prayed, he did good, he said his prayers, he, went, he probably did all that he could to help those around him. He was a good person, respecting God, honoring God. He probably, like many people today, live by the proverbs of their day. They, they, they live by the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. All good ways to live. But that doesn't produce the salvation of God in us. We can love the Proverbs and love the principles of a good life and we can do all the right things in our cultural moment as Americans to, to bless others and to be kind to others and we'll stand and we'll sit and we'll listen for prayers before all of our public gatherings and, and we'll, we'll, we'll do all the right things in our culture but the question still remains, is your allegiance in Jesus or are you just a God respecter? You're kind of okay with other people. You're, you're okay with the idea of God and you hope that you do enough good than do bad, but you've not given your full allegiance to Jesus in an embodied way. See, God's redeeming wholeness comes through Jesus who was incarnated. He became flesh and blood and lived among us. He embodied what it meant to have a relationship with the Father. And he says, there is no other way to get to God but this way. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In other words, there's only one way to find the redemption, the renewal, and find a life eternal through Christ Jesus and the relationship with the Father. There was only one way, and it is this embodied life following Jesus. It's when they moved from being God-fearing to Jesus-worshiping that something transformative began to happen in their life. How many people do you know who have started at a good beginning? They're, they respect God. They'll even pray here and there and allow you to pray. They like to do good. They're even kind and generous. They're, they're promoting social good. All wonderful things. But Jesus hasn't gotten their full trust and allegiance. There's other things still in their place. And, and what we find is that the very minute, at the very moment, when, when they heard the message about Jesus and said, this is it, they went public with it. They got baptized. Now, being baptized was a real deal. Why? Because they were then denouncing their allegiance to Rome. He was then announcing publicly that Caesar is no longer Lord and that the one in charge of his life is Jesus the King. It was a big deal what he did, what his family did. And it began to set him to no longer just be God-fearing, which is the beginning of a lot of good things, but it began a place where they moved on and saw Jesus centered in their allegiance, transformed by the power of the Spirit. This is Cornelius. This is what happened. And it happened because Peter showed up. Peter went. Peter arrived. Peter was there with them. Now, Peter, in this text, you'll see, was entrenched in a perspective that no longer was consistent with the ongoing work of the Spirit. He had a perspective of the Gentiles and a perspective of Romans, a perspective of those outside the Jewish faith that is not consistent with the outpouring and the purpose of the Holy Spirit. In fact, when the Holy Spirit fell, he, it, Jesus said, it's for all flesh, for all people. And, and Peter intellectually agreed with that, but there were some patterns of thinking that took a little bit 
for them to be renewed and transformed and changed. He had a little bit of that like, uh, he had a little bit of that spiritual snobbery going on. He had a little racism still underneath the surface of his life. A little bit of disdain for certain types of people. Disgust. I'll I'll never touch anything unclean. There are some patterns of thinking that are generational and cultural that don't align with the purpose of Jesus or the mission of the Spirit and work of the Spirit in our lives, and we have to allow ourselves to be renewed in our thinking according to God's Word rather than our cultural upbringing. God was reminding Peter that he was now opening the door that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will experience the salvation of God regardless of your national identity. That was Yahweh's desire. That was Yahweh's election and predestination. That was Yahweh's calling on those. All who call on the name of the Lord now can be saved. I think some wrong beliefs often result in these strongholds in our lives that have to be broken down so that we see people the way God wants us to see people and that our pattern of behavior can begin to change. There was indeed a great schism between the Jewish people and all other pagan nations that fall under the title Gentile. Now, next week, I'm going to talk more about this divide and the reconciliation that the Holy Spirit brings. Next week, I'm going to talk a little bit about the current events that are happening between Israel and Hamas. I'm going to address some things. I'm going to pastor us to a place of, I think, a healthy, proper perspective of these events and of these things and how we should respond and even think biblically about these tensions and realities in this place. But that's next week. I don't have time this week to go into it. So show up next week. And if you're the praying kind, pray for your pastor. Listen, I want us to recognize that God was speaking to Peter in some pretty astounding ways. Gave him a vision, and then he heard the voice of the Holy Spirit. And it aligned with what Jesus had told him and said to him and released to him. And it confirmed some of the things that the Holy Spirit had already spoken to him. Why am I saying this? Because I want you to understand that God still speaks to his followers. The Holy Spirit is a voice who will speak to every believer of Jesus. Let me rephrase that. You can hear God speak to you. God wants you to hear his voice. He still speaks. He speaks through scripture. He speaks through dreams, visions. Visions are the things that you see in your imagination while you're awake. Because a dream only happens while you're a Sleep. I just wanted to, like, make it easy for us to understand. God God speaks to us through inspired thoughts or inward whispers, if you will. He speaks to us through other people. God still speaks and wants to speak to you. In fact, the, the dominant way the Holy Spirit speaks to me is through Scripture, through other people, and through inspired thoughts. That happens often for me. In fact, I'll I'll say things like, I don't know, just kind of inwardly, I had this thought and this sense. It just seemed like this was what God wanted me to do. And it aligned with what the scripture had said, and it didn't contradict the other things that I believe wise people of godly counsel had given to me in my life. And so this is often how I am hearing the voice of God and responding to the voice of the Lord. Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit and needed to move out of his comfort zone to expand his 
reach to other people. And this was the movement that God was having Peter do. In other words, God needed Peter to witness not just to those in the family of God, but wanted to help the message of Jesus move to those outside the faith and family of God, to those far away from God. He wanted to preach to the heathens, to the Gentiles, to the pagans, to the unbelievers of the world. I want to talk for the next few moments on what does it mean to be a radiant witness. Because I believe that the radiant people of God are called to be a witness for God. A witness. People who share their faith. People who tell others the story of Jesus. People who come and embody an incarnational living of the ways of Jesus that help proclaim and declare and help people see the message of Jesus that lead people to Jesus themselves, which is what Peter did with Cornelius today. What does that look like? How do we do that? Well, let me start by saying, you know, as we've been studying the book of Acts, I think uh, there are there are five kind of key characteristics of the early church, of the radiant church, of the radiant people that I think are really, really important for us to distill and identify. In fact, we've kind of pointed out these things along the way as we've studied, and I'll be teaching more in depth about each of these as we go throughout our study. Five things really quick. There's not really in your notes, but you can jot them down. We're going to come back to them, and you'll see that we've already talked about it. There are five uh, characteristics of a radiant people and of a radiant church, and that's simply this. They are a loving community. Radiant people are a loving They care about other people. They are loving, and you see that all through the book of Acts thus far. And number two, they are a learning community. They, they lean in and want to learn. They, they were gathering daily. They were speaking together often. They were, they were helping uh, others experience the, the truth. They were teaching what the scripture said. They were a learning community. In other words, they were a community of people that said, I'm not going to settle for just the verse of the day in the Bible app. I'm going to feast on the word of God myself. I, I wonder if that could be true of us. Like I was thinking this morning, like if you took... In one day, the number of hours that you spent watching movies, reading news articles, listening to music, watching shows, and studying up for fantasy football, (laughs) and then doing research every Sunday for every game of all of the time, if you added up the hours... What is the main thing that you are learning in comparison to the time you spend reading God's word? My guess is that you would spend more time in one day consuming all sorts of information that you don't even get close to if you added up your whole time of studying and reading God's word on your own in a week. Might I challenge us? that if we want to see the things that the early church saw, we need to tap into the power and the understanding of what they recognized, and they were a learning community that went beyond just make me feel good, give me a snippet of a tweet of a Bible verse today. Let me dive in and begin to learn what the scripture is saying and doing. Can I challenge you to to create a little bit more of of an awareness of being a learning community that reads God's word? Loving community, a learning community. They were a generous community. Man, they just were generous all over the place. Doing things on their own and doing things in a corporate way. And I love that about many of us in this space. We're generous and we're learning to be more and more generous as the Lord would lead. They were a miraculous community. We see it in the text even today. Like how miraculous was it that God was orchestrating something with Cornelius and angel shows up and then Peter and God had given Peter the exact dream and the exact vision and at the exact time led him to the exact place with the right people. Like how, like they don't have a phone book or a white pages search on the internet to find out where is Simon the Tanner. Like, where's his house at? Like, how was that even? Like, I'm telling you, like, I am lost without a GPS. It is a miracle I get anywhere ever. Because every dirt road looks the same. Like, oh, you go down by the barn. Oh, that's helpful. Which barn? There's seven on the corner, right? Like, 
I would be lost. Like, it is a miracle, I feel like, that I get anywhere on time and in places when I've got to travel new, spy, new spots. Like, I love the, like, they didn't have that, but they showed up at the right house at the right time with the right people. And God was doing, we see it again and again and again, how the Lord was moving in amazing and miraculous ways. And, and then number five, they were a growing community. And by growing, I don't mean just numerically expanding. I mean they were intentional about sharing their faith in a way that added people to the family of God because they shared the gospel. They didn't just invite people to a gathering where the gospel was shared. Radiant people are witnesses of God for other people. In fact, one of the realities of the the, the early church was they were continually making room for more people to belong to the family of God. Here, here at Faith Church, we have this phrase, let's make room. Let's make room. Radiant people make room for others. Radiant people make room for people to join the family of God because they're willing to be a radiant witness of the truth, inviting people into a community, a growing community, witnessing and sharing our faith. And maybe you've heard of it called evangelism. Right, like I've been there, I've had the tracks and I've passed them out and I've thrown tracks away too. I've told you those stories before. I've I've been door to door, I've been canvassing, I've stood up in mall corners trying to proclaim the gospel to people and getting them to repent and I've preached at people and I've I've done these things trying to help win the lost, to help the lost become found and and it always starts from a good place and a good posture and, and I think that we need to get back to an understanding that the radiant people of God share the gospel with others. Yes. Personally, we recognize that Jesus wants us to lead others to Christ. That there is something that we do in making room for others. Hey, hear me. I, I think there is great value in inviting people to church so that they can encounter the family of God in a new way. I think it's fantastic. So many of us do that. We're inviting, hey, just come to church with us, just come along. And it's part of the journey. And I, I love that we are a, 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 an inviting church. Like we're bringers. We bring not only our faith, we don't only bring our generosity, we don't only bring our faith, we bring people. Amen. Like we're a bringing people. That's good. That's great. That's wonderful. Some of you are here or watching online because somebody sent you the link or invited you to come. And, and I'm so, so thankful. But friends, can... I remind us that the Great Commission was to go and make disciples. Like that's for all of us to do. To share, our, to be a witnessing community. To be a witnessing people. And, and I think that in the next season of our life, just inviting people to church won't help them encounter the risen Christ. And here's why. Hear me, hear me, hear me. There is a growing distrust in our world for organized religion. There is a growing distrust of people in authority. There's a growing distrust in our world of people who uh, do what I do for a living. Every week I have to earn many people's trust and the right to speak into their life. Because by nature of what I do, they have some skepticism and can I be honest? Like, a lot of it is rightly so. From corruption to moral failures to power abuses to churches and people who just said they were Christ-like but were more radioactive than radiant. Like, we all have those stories and those things. But the people in your life have an opportunity for you to be like Jesus in the fact that the life and the work of the Spirit becomes incarnated and embodied in you. And you can show up with your embodied allegiance and faith to Jesus in a way that helps them see what it looks like for Jesus to live in their neighborhood. Yes. Yes. And you can show them the way to Jesus. Yes. This is what Peter did. Jesus himself said in John 17, I'm not asking you to take my followers out of the world, Lord. Like, full stop, that's something we ought to consider really quick. Like, Jesus isn't looking for you to escape out of this world, to go into hiding and to build communities of isolation with only Christianized things. He said, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, Lord. 
but I want you to keep them safe from the evil one. They don't belong to this world any more than I do, Lord. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. And just as you have sent me in this world, I am sending them into the world. Friends, Jesus was sent, and he sent the original disciples out into the world to bring the message and the truth of Jesus to other people so that they could be reconciled to God. And he's sending us still today as the radiant people of God to bring the message of redemption, reconciliation, and the renewal of all things in and through the work of Jesus Christ on our behalf. And he sent us to be proclaimers of that. Not just pastors to be pundits and and, and professional with it, but for you, the people of God, to carry the truth of God to the people that you know and you interact with and you help them see. He was sent and he is sending us. He became flesh. I love how the the message paraphrase translates John chapter 1. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. It says, and the word became human and moved into the neighborhood. God moves into the neighborhood through the people of God who move into the neighborhood. People who are sent, people who are expanding their circles, people who are making room, people who are aware of opportunities to show up like lights in a dark place. Uh, There's an opportunity for you to be incarnated with the love and the message of what it looks like to be a Jesus follower coming up at the end of this month. Uh, It's called Halloween. Where your neighbors and people in our community are going to come to your door. And you have an opportunity to look a kid in the eye and make them feel loved and celebrated like never before. You have the opportunity to demonstrate generosity and buy really good candy And give it by the fistfuls. <laughs> to be light in your... You have an opportunity to talk to your neighbors more in one night than you may have had all year. It's an opportunity for us to show what it looks like for Jesus to live in your neighborhood. Yeah, but I've got some theology... I, yeah, great. Awesome. Set your theology questions aside. Show up like Jesus shows up in a place. Just, we used to do these big, big things and block parties in neighborhoods where we called it light the night, and we've kind of gotten away from it through, throughout COVID and throughout seasons. Can I, can I just encourage you? Go light your own night. You have a light. Let it shine. I thought I'd get a couple of amens, but that's okay. I'm going to move on. I, just, like, like, you have an opportunity to just love. No strings attached. No condemnation. No... Just like, oh, man, you look awesome. Some of these kids have never been looked in the eyes and told them they look amazing. I think it's heartbreaking that they have to dress up and pretend to do that. But let's not miss the opportunity to do that. We have an opportunity to move into the neighborhood, to be sent out, to talk and interact with people outside of the kingdom of God, outside of the family. Cornelius was outside the family of God. Peter went to his home, stepped into his home, big deal, and helped lead him into the family of God. Outsiders become insiders when people who incarnate the life of Christ move in to where they're at in their world. This is what we're seeing in the scriptures, and this is what God is saying. Now, I'm going to take the next, next few minutes to unpack some things, and I'm going to move kind of quickly, and they're going to be pretty practical and pragmatic and even uh, sociological and ph- philosophical for just a minute, but can, can I just jump into this for a second? I, I think there are a couple help, unhelpful ways that people of God, radiant people of God, have tried to share their faith, tried to witness um, so some unhelpful things that have created some tension in our world. Uh, number one unhelpful thing that, that oftentimes Christians do is that we're driven with an agenda, trying to, quote unquote, win them to Christ or preach at them. And often this only leads to legalism and hypocrisy being seen. It's unhelpful. Instead, you know what Peter does here? He models humility. He doesn't show up and preach. He shows up, is welcomed into the home. He's like, hey, what is it that you're questioning? 
But let's ask the questions together. Let's explore these things. What, what's your holdup? What are you looking for? What are you searching for? What is the, the question? He didn't preach at them. He just explored with them. He was earning their trust bit by bit. I think that we need to stop looking at people. Please, 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 please. Stop looking at the people in your world as projects that you need to reconcile. As people who need to be lost and they need to be found. And I gotta, I gotta win one this week, Pastor. I'm gonna win one. I don't want their blood on my hands, Pastor. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna preach and I'm gonna tell them the truth and then I'm gonna help fix their politics and then I'm gonna like, stop. It's, it's just not, it's not helpful. It's not what Peter did. Here's the second thing that we do that is equally unhelpful. This is going to shock some of you, and I'm happy to do it. <laughs> we often try to be relatable to the people that we want to reach for Jesus by lowering our standards of morality and convictions. We try to become like the world instead of recognizing that we're just living in the world. We, we try to lower our moral standards in a way that helps us feel relevant in the process we are ruining our integrity as a witness. That doesn't mean we stop witnessing. You know what that means? We start living according to the right standards of the ways of Jesus Christ. We, we don't lower our standards for relevance sake. We raise our level of repentance. Don't lower your standards for sake of relevance. Raise your standard and consistency of repentance. I think it's possible, friends, hear me, to love people and hold to a high moral standard. It's possible to love people and disagree with decisions and lives that they're living at the same time. It's possible to do it. How do I know? Because I'm a parent. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Your kids ever do something stupid? Then you're like, I, that was the dumb, that was, no, we, no, that was not a good decision, but... They reach a certain age where they get to make some decisions and you have to coach them and stand silent sometimes. Be like, yeah, no, that's, mm, I wouldn't do that. I, I'm trying to coach you and help you see wisdom and you're not seeing it the right way yet. And it's tough. <laughs> but we don't stop loving them. <laughs> and we don't have to take every opportunity to try to convict them. But we can love, and we can play the long game of love. Loving other people is the long game and long view. Let me say it like this. Radiant people need to cultivate relationships that are safe, caring, and build trust with others. It, it, what, what do I mean? I, I think that every time we're, we're talking with people, we need to build trust. We're, our relationships need to be safe. They need to be environments where people feel cared for, genuinely loved, that build trust with them. There, there are kind of two um, realms of thinking that lead to types of conversation. Uh, psychologists and sociologists re refer to one of them as the, the nominal realm, and the other is the phenomenal realm. Nominal realm, this is where it's really personal and really inward, really internal where conversations that require a high value of trust, these are questions of philosophy and opinions and lifestyle and the way we feel about the things in our world and our life. It, it's asking questions like, is there a God? How do you feel about this political view? Uh, how should love look and work in our world? These are questions of an inward soul. And they require a lot of trust here. You don't get to have those conversations with strangers. You don't get to have heart conversations with people that you just met. That takes time to, be, to build up the relational equity to be invited into somebody's inner space like that. In the phenomenal uh, kind of realm and type of conversation, this is very public, very outward, very factual. It's things like, how's the weather? Tell me what your kids are into today. 
How are the Chiefs doing? Can we talk about our fantasy football teams and like pray for one another? Can we like, like, it's really factual, really baseline, really outward facing, just normal things of the outward life. You can have these conversations in a lot of ways. And we need to understand that they are different because if we're going to really get into the soul of a person, if we're really going to talk about the heart of what it it is that God is calling, if we're going to be able to have the conversation that Peter had like with Cornelius, it's going to require a lot of trust. It's going to require a lot of trust. And I want us to understand that building trust happens over time. And it happens because we're caring and genuine and true and honest and we live integrous lives and we embody what it looks like to live the way of Jesus. And when we miss it, we acknowledge, be like, yeah, no, I blew that one. R- friends, radiant witnesses journey with people as they take steps towards Jesus. You want to know how to win souls for Christ? It's not memorizing the Romans' road to salvation. It's embodying a life of an embodied witness of what Jesus has done in you. And as you live your life, you journey with people as they take steps towards Jesus. Can, can I tell you what this looks like for just a minute? It looks like a radiant witness who is filled and empowered and led by the Holy Spirit. A radiant witness is somebody who prays for open eyes and hearts before they ever open their mouth. Radiant witnesses care sincerely for people. Not how they get to spend eternity because they've got a higher mansion and more crowns of life and jewels in their crown because they've won more souls than anybody else. No, no. They care about people. They love people sincerely. Radiant witnesses are bold with their opportunities. See, because as you build trust and caring relationships, people will open up to a more nominal conversation with you and they're going to let you into their life and their soul. That's when we get to be bold with the truth of Jesus and really drenched in the love of God for them. When we get to love them in those moments. Radiant witnesses, don't miss this. Radiant witnesses, They love Jesus genuinely. I I don't live with the desire to see people not go to hell. That's like a double negative in that sentence. I realize that. Forgive me. Like my motive for helping people see Jesus isn't because I don't want them to go to hell because that's punishable and that's awful and oof, ah, man, that's going to be bad. And it is. Can, can, Can I tell you why I want to be an embodied, radiant witness for Jesus? Build relationships that matter, that last, that journey with people towards Jesus. It's because I love Jesus an awful lot. And as I have grown in the love of God, don't miss this, friends. I'm growing in my love for other people. People who are different than me, people who have come from different backgrounds, people who screw up a lot. People who take, 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 take and don't ever say thank you or contribute. From me, from our nation, from our church. We love because he first loved us. And when we genuinely love Jesus, we genuinely love his creation. And we want to lead them to Jesus. We we become journeymen and guides. I want to show you an image up on the screen and I don't want you to ever, ever forget this. Every person in the world is on a journey towards or away from Jesus. And when I'm talking about being a radiant witness, I'm talking about being a radiant witness journeyman, spiritual guide, leading people to Jesus. Some people that you know are in this prodigal unbeliever and they're way far away from meeting the real Jesus. 
Some of you are, are close. You're, you're close to meeting the real Jesus. You're, you're learning. You're growing. You, you're taking. And, and every conversation you have, every sermon you listen to, every, every Sunday that you sit here, you take another little step towards meeting the real Jesus. That is a next step. Not every step towards Jesus is on the other side of meeting the real Jesus and becoming a radiant person of God. See, some of you have crossed the line. You've met the real Jesus and you're, you're journeying with the people around you and journeying with your connect group and journeying with our church to become the radiant people of God. You are growing in your, your life. That's what we want to do. We all want to become more like Jesus in that way. But there are people in our world who way are on the other side. They are far away from Jesus. And we are called to be the radiant witnesses that don't lower our standards, that don't treat them with legalism and contempt, but we love them genuinely. We are sure of the message of Jesus as we embody it ourselves and we help them take steps towards Jesus all along the way. And sometimes it's a long process. Sometimes it doesn't happen overnight, but we keep building healthy relationships. We keep showing up like Jesus shows up in relationships. We keep praying that their eyes would be open and their hearts would be softened and that the love of God would flow out of our life into their life and that, that one day... They would meet the real Jesus and have an encounter like Cornelius where they would move from being culturally okay with being a God-fearer, someone who prays often and does good deeds, but they have an encounter with the risen Jesus. Not because we brought them to church, but because we showed up as the people of God in their world. And we were witnesses to them. We invited them into our homes for dinner. We sat with them and asked the questions. We took the time to build the, 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 the social level of understanding as we get to know each other on the outside and then invite them slowly into our inner world. Friends, this is our call. Jesus has sent us into the world to do this very thing. Some of you here today, and this is the first time you're seeing this, and you're thinking to yourself, I know I'm on the opposite side. I'm on the unbelieving side of meeting the real Jesus. Some of you know you're on the other side, but you know there are people who are on that journey path, and you need to go journey with them. There are, Friends, hear me. We always, through our love, our authenticity, and our integrity, are earning the right to be heard in people's lives. They're not an assignment or a project or something that we've got to win and get them to. We've got to have a high conversion rate. We've got to make the sale. We've got to do it. We've got to make them, make them sign the deal, seal the deal, get them in the water. Let's go. people are creations of God to be loved and led to meet the real Jesus. This is who we are. Radiant witnesses for Jesus. Not just beating people with the Bible. Ah, you're wrong. And it's, here's the morality and the things. And rah. You don't have the right to speak to other people's morality yet. You haven't built the relationship. I'm not saying it's wrong to hold the standard. No, we still hold the standard. We still live in that way. We don't get to beat people up with that. We get to loving live an example of what it looks like to live that way, though. And we allow our lives to flourish in love with Christ. And I'm not saying that we don't respond and speak the truth, but we only speak the truth when we're asked about it because we've built the relationship with them because there's a safety, trusted space to do that in people's lives. Would you stand with me? I went a little longer this morning than I intended. But as you close your eyes, would you take a couple deep breaths and just ask the Lord, Lord, would you make me a radiant witness for your name? As you take a couple deep breaths, maybe you're here today and you are like Cornelius. You are a God-fearing, good person, generous at times, want to do more good than harm in the world but you've never given your trust and allegiance to Jesus. 
And today, inwardly, you're just going to simply breathe in and breathe out and say, Jesus, be my Lord. I give you all of me. And you're going to make surrender in this moment. Some of you have been trying to witness to people, but you've been lowering the standard of your own life. You've been making compromises and you've justified them. And you need to make repentance today. Jesus, help us receive your love. Help us to grow in our love for you. And in turn, love the people around us as we show them what it looks like to move into the neighborhood and live this life for your namesake. We pray this in the name of the Father. Son, and Holy Spirit. And everybody said, amen. I really hope today's message was life-giving. As a church, we want to help you encounter God and take another next step in your allegiance to Jesus. I want to ask you to take a step right now, in fact. Would you just share this message with a friend? Maybe post it on your social, text a coworker the link. Just be sure to include something that you learned or how it impacted you personally. When you do that, you get to be a part of seeing faith come to life in someone else. And don't forget to visit our central hub, faithchurchks.org. You'll find other next steps that you can take in your faith, including giving and partnership with us as we help others encounter Jesus like you've encountered him. Hey, we love you. And until we get to hang out again, remember, don't shrink back from your faithful allegiance to King Jesus.